Milwaukee, Wisconsin, an industrial city hard on the banks of Lake Michigan. Wind and rain regularly sweep across the lake. So in the 1990s, Milwaukee decided to build a new weather-resistant baseball stadium for the hometown Brewers. Miller Park would feature a unique fan-shaped retractable roof. A 12,000-ton giant, costing $50 million, with seven panels that open or close in 10 minutes. Installing the roof required one of the world's largest machines, the 45-story tall Big Blue Crane. A crawler crane, Big Blue can travel over ground while simultaneously maneuvering its giant arm. At 567 feet, it's nearly twice as tall as the Statue of Liberty. The crane was huge. It was far taller than the top of the stadium. It was literally about 100 feet above the top of the stadium. On July 14, 1999, crane operators prepared to lift the single largest section of the roof, a piece weighing an estimated 450 tons. The load they were carrying was about three-eighths of an acre, which is larger than the average house lot in a development. The average house lot's got like 10,000 square feet in it, you know, a quarter of an acre. And here we got three-eighths or almost a half of an acre, you know, almost twice that. Big blue cranes require four people to run them. One operator sits in the front crawler unit, which supports the boom. Another is in the rear crawler, which contains up to four million pounds of gravel that acts as ballast. The third operator who runs the lift cables sits in a cab on the 100-foot-long truss that connects the two sections. All three men are largely blind to the crane's overall maneuvering, so they follow radio instructions from a supervisor on the ground. Five fifteen p.m. with the roof piece suspended high above first base, Big Blue began to buckle. My friend and I looked at each other and said, "That ain't right. There's something wrong with this." And then all of a sudden, the crane just started drifting. We're like, "Are they moving?" And then it's like, "No, it's not moving. They're not moving it. It's it's coming on its own." Oh, it's just an incredible loud sequence of noises. First, you heard the brakes coming off of the crane. Then you heard the first pop. Then you heard the next pop. The hell is that? What's going on here? And then you heard a cacophony of sound where everything is coming down. Watch it, watch it. Afterwards, as I went to the inner part of the stadium, I saw what a huge mass of tangled steel and rubble that existed on the center part of the stadium. We had hundreds of tons of steel intermingled into the world's largest pickup sticks pile I have ever seen. Amid the rubble lay the greatest cost of the disaster. Chunks of concrete roof debris had struck a basket containing three steel workers sending them plummeting 300 feet to their deaths. There were three people sitting near home plate, down near home plate. And uh, that's has one hell of an impact on people. Uh, I still don't go to ball games because if I look at home plate, I'll think of it. So uh, I don't think I'll ever see a Miller Park ball game. The disaster stunned the citizens of Milwaukee and shook an entire industry. For the crane industry, it was like 10 on the Richter scale. One of our icons was down, it collapsed. It's a major catastrophe. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, moved immediately to investigate. Still photos from the scene showed the stadium flag in full flourish an early sign that high winds had played the decisive role. The wind was estimated at 10 to 20 miles per hour at ground level, and even gustier where the load had dangled from Big Blue. 
and since it's so close to the edge of the stadium, you're getting a, a rolling effect from these winds and increasing the velocity. And you're talking about this is like 190, 200 feet in the air where, this, where the wind is coming over the stadium. So it's coming against the stadium, rolling up over it, and blowing against the loads. The heavier the load, the lower the acceptable wind speed. But OSHA determined that crane operators rushing to keep on schedule had negligently failed to take any wind measurements. Winds over 10 miles per hour should have postponed the lift. Instead, the crew went forward, with gusts exceeding 30 miles per hour. The load had swayed so severely that a foot-thick kingpin bolt securing the crane's base had nearly sheared off, causing the loud pops heard by eyewitnesses and toppling the crane. Hey, watch it, watch it. When you're talking Big Blue, you're talking about a big team of people working on this thing. You're talking about very sophisticated construction workers that are used to doing really heavy construction. To see a crew of four separate operators agree to do that lift under those conditions amazed me. It just shouldn't happen. In 2000, the Milwaukee County jury found the crane operators 97% liable and the crane manufacturers 3% responsible for failing to fully communicate Big Blue's limitations. The jury awarded the families of the three dead steel workers punitive damages of $94 million. As a result of the accident, OSHA issued new directives governing the training of heavy construction workers. Since then, there have been serious reform. They're teaching the, the operators more engineering. You have to check, and you have to check, and you have to check. Uh, and your life depends on it. And your co-workers' lives depend on it. At Miller Park, a statue of the three victims stands as a memorial to them, and a warning to those who would succumb to the pressures of time and money. Some people will make a decision based on money rather than doing it safely. I've... Uh done enough inspections in my career to see that happen several times. So, taking a shortcut here to save a buck sometimes can cost a fortune. In countries that severely limit workers' rights and their ability to seek damages, there is an even greater temptation to place efficiency above safety. China in the 21st century is an industrial powerhouse one of the world's fastest growing economies. But this economic giant still relies on an ancient source of power, coal, for 70% of its energy needs. On February 16, 2005, a methane explosion tore through the Sunjiawan coal mine in northeastern China, killing 214 miners. For most victims, death was instantaneous. You're like inside a bomb. It's not like the movies where they see a ball of fire coming down the, <laughs> coming down the tunnel and say, uh-oh, <laughs> you know. Um, it, it happens in a millisecond. It happens in a fraction of a fraction of a second. Methane gas occurs naturally in the voids within rock and is released as a coal vein is torn open. If the methane reaches concentrations in the air between 5 and 16 percent, the least little spark can ignite it. That tiny explosion instantly combusts with floating coal dust, triggering a massive blast. The details of the Sunjiawan explosion are hidden behind the official secrecy of China's government-owned mines. But that tragedy is just one in a long line of Chinese coal mine accidents. Since 2002, explosions have killed 166 miners in the province of Sanji, 148 in Hunan, and 124 in Heilongjiang. Each year, an astonishing 6,000 Chinese miners perish in fires, floods, and explosions. An average of 16 per day, and 80% of the world's coal mining fatalities. Chinese mines operate with antiquated technology dating back half a century and more. The miners still use picks and shovels, so 20 men collect as much coal as one American miner. 
This inefficiency means the Chinese mines are heavily populated with potential victims. And the Chinese government has apparently made a cool and calculated cost-benefit analysis. Coal miners are very badly paid in China. They were very badly compensated for the deaths. If you add up more than 200 deaths in this coal mining accident alone, they were talking about paying off a total of $2 million. If you're talking about that kind of penalty for having a very bad accident, it's obviously going to be always cheaper to have the accident. For decades, American miners toiled under conditions similar to those faced by Chinese miners today. Poverty wages, no political power, and no government regulation made U.S. mines diddly places to make a living. Then in 1969 came the formation of MSHA, the Mining Safety and Health Association. The new federal agency exercised powerful oversight backed by inspections every three months, a practice that continues to this day. The inspectors, they come quarterly, they do their inspections to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do, and if we're not, they tell us about it. And they have the right to shut you down if you're not doing it, till you do do it right. In American, as in Chinese coal mines, methane poses a grave hazard. The January 2006 explosion at the Sago mine in West Virginia reminded the world of this ever-present danger. But a multi-pronged approach to safety has drastically reduced methane accidents in the U.S. Here at the National Coal Corporation in Jacksboro, Tennessee, a high-pressure water system runs two miles underground, providing enough water to constantly douse the coal dust. So what you're looking at is the water sprays on the continuous miner. It uh, pulls the dust out of the air. Therefore, it's a much better breathing environment. It takes away the chances for explosion. If it don't pull it down and get it out of the air, then it becomes float dust. The float dust is what causes the biggest explosion in a mine fire. Another defense against a buildup of coal dust is a robust ventilation system. This giant fan produces 160,000 cubic feet of air per minute. Enough to create a steady stream of fresh air throughout the mine. Methane content is constantly monitored all along the production line. 11 foot wide mechanical miners, the machines that actually drill the rock, have monitors that register methane levels at the rock face. And unlike in China, each section foreman carries his own methane detector. You, you carry these with you at all times. There gotta be somebody on the section at all times with one of these. Or you have to check every place every 20 minutes. And you, you just turn it on, you push this button right here, and you just go up and you sweep across the top. And then you turn loose your button, and if you have any methane, it'll show up on this reading right here. Both explosions and the sheer weight of the earth can trigger cave-ins. To maintain the mine shaft's structural integrity, four-foot-deep ceiling bolts are drilled every four feet. Once a hole is made, long sticks of glue in plastic bags are inserted, followed by steel bolts that are spun into place for eight seconds. The glue spreads into tiny fissures in the surrounding rock, creating an ultra-hard resin. Together, the steel and the resin form a support structure as strong as a concrete beam. As a final safeguard, American miners are required by law to carry a self-rescuer. This is a, a CSE uh, self-rescuer that all the men carry. It has an apparatus tube that goes in your mouth. It also has goggles and a nose clip. There's a pin you pull. You strap this thing to your chest after everything's been put on your face and uh, it gives you one hour of oxygen to, so you can escape the mines. Despite all the precautions, coal mining remains a very dangerous business. In recent years, new high-tech solutions have helped the search for miners trapped underground. Seismic location systems, sensitive enough to detect man-made vibrations. Remote-controlled robots, who can venture where humans cannot. 
and send back information via fiber optic cable and heat signature sensors that seek out the living. But Chinese coal mines have yet to employ even 1970s era technology, much less more recent advances. In 2002, Beijing announced the country's first mine safety laws and promised nationwide inspection of coal mines. But most observers feel that words have yet to be followed by deeds. And the government keeps saying, well, it's going to do something about it. It's going to set rules. Going to set rules, going to set rules, going to set rules. But nothing happens. The problem remains and people die. There's an old expression concerning how oil and water don't mix. On one winter afternoon in 1963, residents of Los Angeles found that old expression acquired new meaning. On that day, oil wells played a surprising part in an engineering failure involving oil exploration, earthquake fault lines, and a giant public works project with a tiny hidden flaw. A flaw that forced a crack in a reservoir to become a crevasse and unleash the fury of millions of gallons of water. And right here now, as we come up over the Baldwin Hills Reservoir, you can see the water. It's unbelievable as this water and mud rushes down Cloverdale, engulfing everything in its path. In 1951, when it was built in Los Angeles, the Baldwin Hills Dam was hailed as a $10 million state-of-the-art engineering masterwork. It was a 19-acre reservoir that supplied drinking water for tens of thousands of residents. The dam's hidden flaws became apparent at 3.38 p.m. on December 14, 1963. We can see the main break in the reservoir itself. At that hour, the lining, a thin asphalt barrier that separated the bottom of the reservoir from the earth below, cracked apart. The designers relied far too much on the quarter-inch fiber-reinforced asphalt layer at the base of the liner system. You have to understand that it was assumed in the design, and it was absolutely essential to the stability of the reservoir that no water get into the foundation. Water in the foundation caused the bottom of the dam to erode away, and authorities were concerned that the compromised reservoir would flood a nearby residential neighborhood. As police were called in to evacuate the area, word got out there was trouble at the dam. I remember it being a Saturday morning. I was in my room. I was 17 years old. And I remember hearing uh, a news report on his television in the living room that there was a problem with the Baldwin Hills Dam. Richard Levine was a student photographer about to document his first big story. Grabbing his camera and a few rolls of film, he raced to the scene. When I got down there, it was absolutely amazing. It was the most chilling sight I'd ever seen. I mean, to this day, I still think about it, and chills go down my spine. To the horror of the city workers gathered at the site, in about an hour, the rushing water eroded the dam's concrete abutment from below, turning a pencil-thin crack into a 75-foot-wide gash. When the abutment crumbled, 292 million gallons of water surged out of the reservoir. A large chunk of the inner cement here in the... This water was tumbling and rushing and boiling. It was just washing homes out. There's a picture. You can see those automobiles literally being pushed back. Then went over the it top... It reminded me of the Great Gorge of the Colorado River. And I shot until I eventually ran out of film. over, 65 homes in the path of the flood were ripped apart. Hundreds of other structures were damaged, and five people lay dead. I hadn't even seen the worst part, because I was up at the top of the dam where it washed out those homes. They were just gone. It was just foundations left. They just wiped them out. City workers drained the rest of the water from the dam and homeowners were left to sort through the wreckage. Engineers went back to the original plans to learn what caused the lining to fail, fatally compromising the dam. 
they discovered that the failure could be blamed not only on how the dam was designed, but also the location where it was built. The Baldwin Hills Dam was constructed 400 feet from a large fault line. Smaller secondary faults ran beneath the dam. If any of the faults were to shift, the lining was intended to flex with their movement. In this way, the integrity of the dam would be maintained. But that's not what happened on December 14th. This puzzled investigators because they knew the dam was built with the existing fault lines in mind. The designers attempted to deal with this. They realized the faults were there, but they underestimated how much movement would occur across the faults. The lining was made by putting down a layer of gravel, followed by a quarter inch thick layer of asphalt reinforced with cotton fiber. But when the faults moved, this material proved to be less flexible than designers may have wished, and it failed. Underestimating the potential for fault movement was a fatal error. But what had caused the faults to move more than the designer expected? Investigators determined that other hidden factors were at play. This bowl, the Bowen Hills Reservoir site, is on the eastern edge of the Inglewood oil field. Inglewood oil field is probably about a square mile in area or more, and it has about over 600 wells at one time. Pumping oil near the dam might have caused the land to become unstable and thus stimulate fault movement. But the oil companies were also using a method of oil extraction that raised a red flag. The method was called pressurized extraction. The process is to eject water under high pressure and to cause that water to and oil to push towards the active wells. The pressure extraction process involves pumping millions of gallons of water at high pressure beneath an oil field, which forces the oil toward the surface, where it is easier to pump out. The extraction method apparently built up great below-ground pressure. I looked at the gauge on the well itself, and it registered at 600 pounds per square inch. And that was on top of the ground, and the well was either 1,000 or 2,000 feet deep. So you can imagine the pressure that was being exerted on the ground, which eventually caused the separation of the bottom here. Experts speculated that this intense pressure could have contributed to destabilizing the faults beneath the reservoir. But in the end, Authorities could agree on no single condition that would have caused the dam to fail. Rather, a combination of factors. Fault movement, spurred on by oil exploration, and brittle structural elements in the lining of the dam acted in concert to create the disaster. Well, the fact that they didn't have an adequate review process during the design of the reservoir and its embankment led to a situation where design flaws were not captured. The Baldwin Hills Dam was never rebuilt, and after the reservoir was filled in, the land was turned into a park. Now only a serene hilltop marks the scene of the disaster. In part because of Baldwin Hills, dams built near fault lines now receive special scrutiny, and peer review is mandatory for all public works projects. For 40 years, one machine was considered a nearly indispensable tool for buying shoes that fit. From the 1920s through the 1950s, no top flight shoe store was complete without the wondrous shoe fitting fluoroscope. Customers, most often children and their fast growing feet, placed a foot above an x-ray tube. The x-ray passed through the foot and shoe to project an image on a fluorescent screen. There were three separate viewfinders, allowing Junior, Mom, and the salesman to share in the fun. For the child, it was actually exciting. You know, Mom could say, come on, Junior, let's go to the shoe store. And instead of the kid going, oh, I have to go to the shoe store again. No, you know, now they have this, this new piece of equipment. It's the most modern thing. You get to actually see your feet being measured for the proper size. The fluoroscope enticed children into stores by making shopping a gee whiz experience. And it reassured parents that they were doing right by their child. In the 1920s, scientific child rearing was 
all the rage. And uh, mothers were being taught that they should use prepared formula instead of breast milk, using perfectly scientifically fit shoes fit with this very, very well. In 1950, there were 10,000 shoe fitting fluoroscopes across America. But by 1960, the devices had all but vanished, unmasked as major health hazards. The machines emitted radiation doses of 20 to 75 rems per minute. In 2005, the maximum legal dose for workers in nuclear power plants was 5 rems per year. In 1895, German scientist Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen discovered a new form of energy he named the X-ray. Visible light cannot pass through most human tissue, but X-rays, which emanate from radioactive substances, operate on a wavelength that penetrates denser material, including human skin. Even denser tissue, like human bone, will block the ray and cast a dark shadow on a photographic plate. In the U.S., Thomas Edison immediately saw the significance of the X-ray and put his lab to work developing its potential. The Edison team invented a new device, the fluoroscope, that allowed X-ray images to be imprinted on phosphorescent screens and viewed in real time. Edison lab assistant Clarence Daly paid a gruesome price for the advancing technology. Falling prey to radiation exposure, he lost both arms to malignant ulceration before dying an excruciating death. And he was not alone. In the first 20 years of the 20th century, dozens and dozens and dozens of workers who had worked with radiation of all kinds uh, were dying. And in fact, they were glorified as martyrs to science. Horrified by Daly's fate, Edison halted his radiological work and never again allowed himself to be x-rayed. But during World War I, a Boston doctor realized he could see more patients by using Edison's fluoroscope to examine veterans' feet without removing their boots. The idea caught on, and by the 1920s, shoe-fitting fluoroscopes were a hugely successful sales gimmick. In the 1920s, the sales pitch was, it's good for your health because ill-fitting shoes can endanger your child's health. In the 1930s, with the Depression, the sales pitch changed. They started talking about, well, a pair of shoes that's well-fitting also will wear longer, so you don't have to buy as many pairs of shoes. The advertising was extremely flexible. It fit the period the same way the shoes were supposed to fit the child. Year after year, shoe salesmen irradiated their customers and themselves on a regular basis. When shoe store salesmen used these devices, they weren't paying any attention to the dangers. They would move them around like a big piece of equipment, like you'd move a radio or move a uh, television set. Careful, but not too careful. Things got jostled, things got damaged, shielding got shifted. So the foot that you're putting, or the feet, if you're young enough, that you're putting in there, not the only thing being irradiated. In fact, it's mom who's looking in one portal, it's the salesman looking in the other portal, the child is up on the little podium looking in, all of them are being irradiated all over. Finally, in 1949, studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine confirmed what many had long suspected. The machines produced enough radiation to have caused untold numbers of deformities, infertilities, and deadly cancers. Here was a technological application that came with high risk and absolutely no reward. The shoe fluoroscope was a gimmick in a lot of ways. It is true you could get a picture of the foot inside the shoe that you probably couldn't get otherwise, but it really didn't matter. Good, careful measurements and careful fitting of a shoe by a skilled shoe store salesman would have given you the same result. Radiation pioneers who gave their lives to their work were called martyrs to science. Those who sacrificed their lives and their good health to the shoe-fitting fluoroscope might best be known as martyrs to commerce. Inland from Los Angeles, California, lies the Salton Basin. A desert bowl of nearly 400 square miles, 280 feet below sea level. 
Over the eons, the character of the basin has varied, sometimes dry and dusty, other times filled with rain or Colorado River water. Today, the area contains a great sea that grows more toxic each year. Massive fish and bird die-offs have blighted its waters, and the implications for human health are grim. As the 20th century dawned, the basin was bone dry. But the privately owned Imperial Land Company was eager to develop towns and sell land. In 1905, the company dug an irrigation canal to divert Colorado River water to surrounding farmland. But heavy flooding breached the canal banks. And for 18 months, water flowed freely into the Salton Depression. Because of the flooding of the sea, there was a serious thought that it may not stop flooding and it would rise and rise. Aggregate rock on railroad cars was collected throughout the United States, brought to this area in order to stop the flooding. By the time the breach was finally repaired, a vast inland oasis had formed, the present day Salton Sea. Everyone thought at the time that uh, once they fixed the breach, the bowl would simply dry up again, it would evaporate. It didn't happen. Engineers had failed to account for the growing inflow of agricultural wastewater. In 1924, the federal government designated the Salton Sea a permanent farm drainage reservoir. California's Imperial Valley would help feed the world, and its watery residue would maintain the sea. After World War II, you have a bunch of things happen that are all trends in the wrong direction. First of all, more agriculture, more water use, more agricultural chemicals being used. They go way beyond what's natural. You have DDT, you have uh, defoliants, you have uh, other persistent pesticides. Pesticides that once they're let loose in nature, they don't go away. They just exist. But the sea still looked fresh and inviting. In the 1950s, it became a major resort center as Southern California's booming population flocked to buy seaside houses, join the beach and yacht club, swim, fish, and boat. For decades, Salton Sea State Park was one of the most popular destinations in America. In the heyday of the resort area, this was a popular recreation area for the Hollywood elite, for a lot of Los Angeles and San Diego Basin to come over and recreate. There were boat races, there's camping facilities, it is a big open body of water. Today, the area is all but abandoned, littered with reminders of its bright past. It has fallen prey to a ticking time bomb as each year, agricultural runoff deposited five million tons of salt into the sea. People did recognize 30, 40 years ago that the future of the Salton Sea was bleak if nothing was done. You keep putting water that's laden with salt into a place where the salt can't escape and you're evaporating off the water. It doesn't take a mental giant to realize you're increasing the salt content. And over time, that's going to kill the biology. By 1995, salt levels had reached 45 parts per thousand, 25% saltier than the Pacific Ocean. As its ecology grew unstable, the area was bedeviled by a series of massive bird and fish die-offs. In 1996, type C avian botulism killed thousands of white and brown pelicans. The exact cause of the outbreak remains unknown, although it was apparently not connected to the water's rising salinity. The Salton Sea is a highly complex ecosystem, and it still supports hundreds of species. As other wetlands deteriorate or disappear, birds from near and far rely on the sea for their very life. 
We used to have wetlands up and down the coast of California, but we've lost more than 90% of them. And so many of the 400 plus bird species at the Salton Sea use this as their sole refueling stop in Southern California. Despite the challenges for the Salton Sea, it's one of the most important ecosystems in the United States for birds and other wildlife. It has over 400 bird species over the course of the year. That's two-thirds of all the bird species in the United States and Canada. Um, it truly is an oasis in the desert for wildlife. But it's no longer an oasis for humans. Vacationers and nature lovers have all but vanished driven away by serious health hazards. Decaying fish, algae, and bacteria emit hydrogen sulfide gas, ripe with the pungent odor of rotting eggs. Even more disturbing, increasing amounts of Imperial Valley water is now diverted to urban Southern California, reducing inflows to the Salton Sea and causing it to shrink. As the sea becomes smaller, the soil and sediment that it leaves behind, which is now exposed to the air, is very light. It's very light particulate matter, and with not very much wind at all, it can create enormous and very dangerous dust storms that cause a whole range of respiratory illnesses, some quite long term. As the sea becomes smaller, the remaining exposed basin could become the single largest source of dust pollution in the United States. If current trends continue, the Salton Sea will die. But there are plans that could once again make it a haven for all forms of life. The leading restoration plans look to divide the sea with a giant barrier, concentrating excess salt in a so-called brine sink. It's very ambitious, it's very expensive. The barrier, depending on where you place it, is one of the longest earthen barriers in the world. Restoration plans would segregate bodies of water on each end of the sea, allowing water and salt to flow from them into the central brine sink area. In the shallow southern end, a series of dikes would cordon off a wildlife refuge. In the north, a seven-mile-long, 50-foot-deep barrier requiring 60 million cubic yards of rock fill, or 20 times the amount of material used to build the Great Pyramid in Egypt would create a lake for human recreation. While the costs and complications of restoring part of the Salton Sea are enormous, the price of doing nothing may be higher still. This was once part of the Aral Sea in the former Soviet Union. At one time, these valleys held a great body of water. Much of Central Asia ate the fish that flourished here. These satellite images show the region south of Russia over the last 30 years. The Aral Sea has lost 60% of its original size. What was once the world's fourth largest inland sea is now the 10th largest. The Aral Sea was a healthy sea for thousands of years until Nikita Khrushchev visited the Midwest, Midwestern United States, and fell in love with a lot of American agricultural practices, including our irrigation practices. And when he went back to the Soviet Union, without any concern for the communities around the Aral Sea, he began to divert large amounts of water from the sea for agricultural irrigation. They started a project to greatly use more water than went in the Aral. And what they were going to do to bring in that extra water was to go change one of the rivers that went to the north. They were going to bring it back down around um, and dump it into the Aral. The plan to divert water into the Aral was abandoned as too costly. But its sister project, taking water away from the Aral, went forward. Large dams were built across the Amu Darya and Sir Darya rivers and an 850-mile central canal with a far-reaching system of feeder canals was created. Eventually, the Soviets would dig nearly 25,000 miles of canals to divert mountain water to irrigate cotton fields. The Aral quickly began to shrink. Within two decades, its shoreline receded more than 100 miles, leaving behind haunting remnants. A once thriving fishing industry was wiped out, costing 60,000 people their livelihood. Pesticides, including Agent Orange, were sprayed on the cotton and made their way to the Aral, 
They combined with high salinity to kill off 20 species of fish. The two biggest problems at the Aral Sea are air pollution and water quality. Thousands of people still depend on the Aral Sea for the fish that it provides, but the water quality has become heavily, heavily contaminated and is growing worse over time. And so the cancer rates from both the air and water pollution at the Aral Sea are enormous. Almost everybody there drinks tea, and they're using the water that, that is high salinity. Um, even the children drink tea. And so what that does inside kids especially is it develops gallstones and others, they call them stones disease. But with the quality of the water is so poor that what you're doing is you're basically killing your kids. Even though the tragic scale of the disaster has long been apparent, no one in a position of power has intervened to help the primary victims, the Karakabak people. The value system there was produce cotton. If it hurts the people, um, they're just caracal pox. You know, it's like, so what's the big deal? Those are people that in the U.S. you might look at it like an Indian reservation. And so the impact of the people that were Russian was very much to look very much down on those people. And those were then the people that you could do things to them. And it was of no consequence. Today, nearly 40 million people grow their crops with the water that used to flow to the Aral. No one proposes that the sea should or could be restored. For the Karakapak fishermen forced to turn to agriculture, the best hope is to learn modern, efficient, and safe methods of farming. Ironically, help may come from farmers at the Salton Sea. What pesticides do you use? When do you pick? Um, what, how do you get rid of bugs? Those are not part of the, the knowledge base of what's in Central Asia. And that's profoundly something that people here could take answers from the Salt Sea and they could convey them to people there. Western farmers possess the knowledge of modern farming techniques so desperately needed by people at the Aral Sea. But as the Karakapaks have learned so well, Western technologies must be adopted with caution. I think the big lesson of the Aral Sea is you have to be very, very careful when you try to re-engineer what nature has created. There's a lot that scientists still don't understand and we're learning over time but we take great risk when we try to change the course of a river as we did here at the Salton Sea or we drain an enormous body of water as we have at the Aral Sea. At both the Salton and Aral Seas, for generations to come, millions of people will live and die with the profound consequences of drastically altering nature's design.